All right, erudites, tell me how many American presidents are not buried in the United States? Three. Four. 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 John, uh, Nixon, Carter. <laughs> right. Reagan. All right. Another test. Does the sun go around the earth or does the earth go around the sun? They go around each other. <laughs> How so? They both oscillate around the center of gravity. Well, you, I've never had that. Uh, you've, you've completely confused me. <laughs> I was going to suggest that all, you, all of you knew that the earth orbits the sun. Yes. But before Copernicus, why well, everybody knew that the sun went around <laughs> the earth because you can see it. And I'm suggesting that that's the way it is in economics. What you see on the surface is not always so. And the free market, as Fr Milton Friedman says, takes a subtlety of understanding. It's awfully easy to see that if a thing needs doing, you pass a law, and harder to see that the law might actually confute what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and that laissez-faire, a policy of stay out, might work. So I'm going to try to demonstrate to you tonight that the class struggle, the doctrine of the class struggle is fallacious, that it's a myth, that in fact there is no class struggle, although it's almost universally believed that there is one. And then beyond theory, try to show why wages rise. What is the process whereby wages rise? We talk about what's seen and what is not seen. Well, the class struggle, this idea of hostility between employers and employees, between management and labor, as I say, is almost universal. And let me give you some illustrations. Uh, you will pick up the paper in the morning and you'll read, if you're in Milwaukee, about Miller Brewing Company workers being on strike, or in some other town about some other company uh, employees being on strike. And you see the management resisting wage increases, trying to hold their costs down. And the workers bargaining collectively, going on strike if necessary to get a increased proportion of the product and therefore obviously there is an opposition of interest and there is, really is an antagonism between the employer and the employee therefore ipso facto there is in effect a class struggle and this belief is widespread as I say and some quotes that I have here will tend to demonstrate that here's a quotation from the papal encyclical quadragesimo anno in which it is said that the demand and the supply of labor divides men on the labor market into two classes as into two camps. And the bargaining between these parties transforms this labor market into an arena where the two armies are engaged in combat. Here's Jack London. The whole history of mankind has been a history of contests between exploiting and exploited. A stage has been reached whereby the exploited cannot attain its emancipation without once and for all emancipating society at large from all future exploitation, oppression, class distinction and class struggles. The Wall Street Journal says that the Commerce and Labor Departments remarked recently that the interests of labor and management are naturally antagonistic. UAW President Douglas Fraser, speaking in the Freeman in May 1981, was quoted as saying that the Chrysler Board, as a Chrysler Board Director, his new role, quote, would not alter the traditional adversary relationship between the UAW and the auto companies, unquote. Get that in, adversary relationship. And Jay Mazur, also a union business agent, saying, with all due respect to the employers who are my adversaries, they wouldn't pay anyone a dollar an hour. And then finally, a quotation from the Toronto Globe and Mail saying, I guess we in Canada must accept the inevitability of enmity mistrust, outright warfare between employers and employees. We must also accept as inevitable the economic consequences thereof, which are already starting to show themselves in the unemployment figures. So it's not a rare thing to read about this idea of class struggle. Almost everybody believes it, that the working man, the businessman, for instance, might say, well, at one time, uh, the employers had things all their own way and the unions were necessary and collective bargaining was necessary and maybe it's gone too far now but it was necessary to have unions at one time and that's because of this belief in the class struggle. Karl Marx in his little minor tract called Wage, Labor and Capital said 
What is the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit in their reciprocal relation? He says they stand in inverse proportion to each other. The share of capital increases in the same proportion in which the share of labor falls and vice versa. So he says there is a reciprocal or an inverse relationship between profits and wages, that there is a class struggle. So it's evident that there's a class struggle, and I'm suggesting to you that it's evident in the same sense that the sun, it's evident that the sun goes around the earth. It appears that the sun's going around the earth. You see it rise in the east and cross the heavens and set in the west. It appears that it goes around the earth, when in fact it only appears that way because the earth is turning on its axis. That there, in fact, you're seeing something that doesn't exist. And because it's widely believed that there is a class struggle, the answer found behind the Iron Curtain is collective ownership of the means of production, of the mines, the mills, the factories, and the answer on this side of the Iron Curtain is democratic socialism, uh, regulation, collective bargaining, and that sort of thing. But on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the idea of class struggle is ubiquitous. There's a dichotomy between the people who believe in the free society and the people who believe in a collectivized society. And if I had to chart that on the board, and one side put the free society, and the other side command, you'd find that the people who believe in the free society and those who believe in the command society do not argue about goals. They do not have differences about goals. You find that almost everybody is in favor of high wages, is in favor of peace and prosperity, and in favor of liberty. But the reason that they divide is because they have different fears. The people on this side fear what they associate with the command society. They look on this as being uh, apt to produce political oppression, uh, the Gulag Archipelago, uh, denial of civil rights. And the people on this side are afraid of what they associate with freedom. They would say this leads to exploitation, it leads to unemployment, it leads to poverty. But they all believe in prosperity, peace, and freedom. Well, there are other names for a free society. How about laissez-faire? <coughs> laissez-faire is a term that's associated with Adam Smith. It was originally derived by the French physiocrats. And it was Gournay, the physiocrat, who said, laissez-faire, laissez-passer, le monde va de lui-même. Any Frenchman here? Let it function. Let it pass. The world works by itself. It will just stay out, and a natural order will, will obtain if people are left to pursue their own resources, to pursue without interference their own resources. Uh, another name might be capitalism, which was a term, I think, originally derived by Karl Marx. And on this side, other terms might be socialism. Now, Marx and Engels used the term socialism and communism interchangeably. And by what they meant was in no way connected with what we call communism and socialism today. Marx in the Communist Manifesto just tore up the utopian socialists and he derided them and he eliminated the various kinds of socialism and he, he then gave us Marxian socialism or scientific socialism, which he said would obtain ultimately after the proletarian revolution then ultimately the political state would wither away and the good society would have arrived. But Marx and Engels used the term socialism and communism interchangeably. Today we tend to think of communism as that order which obtains behind the Iron Curtain. And socialism, we think, is the system such as in England or in Sweden where the government appropriates the wealth and then redistributes it. But there are many kinds of socialism. There's the Marx and scientific socialism, uh, the Soviet socialism of Stalin, there's the National Socialism of Hitler, uh, Democratic Socialism. But in each case, the essential characteristic of socialism is that the individual is subordinate to society. As the Germans said, uh, Gemeinnutz, the Nazis said, Gemeinnutz, Gate for Eigennutz, that the common interest 
goes before the individual interest. And they posit this mystic entity, whether it's called the Third Reich or the people or the commonwealth, and in effect, the government or the mystic order becomes the boss. The individual is a creature of this mystic order. And as a consequence, in a socialist society, you're always conscious of the presence of the masters. When you're behind the Iron Curtain, you're conscious of the presence of the masters. This mystic entity is posited as a savior to the people. It's actually above the people. And on this side, the individual is the important economic unit. And as George Washington was supposed to have said in the farewell address, that government, like fire, can be a useful servant, but a terrible master. And the question is, is the government the servant, or is the government the master? And the tendency is, in the socialist societies, the government is the master. And in the free societies, the government is the, serf is the uh, servant. That's the way it started. Now, so the philosopher of the free society, the economic philosopher, you could say, was Adam Smith. And the philosopher of the collectivist societies tended to be Karl Marx. There were two gentlemen named John from Geneva, John Calvin, who said that man is corrupt, fallen in the Garden of Eden, and that he is self-interested. And there's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, also from Geneva, who said that man in his original state was kind of a noble savage, and that he was only corrupted by the institutions of civilization, by private ownership of the means of production by property. And then the communist Proudhon, in that same vein, said, what is property? Property is theft. And I've always wanted to ask Proudhon if I could have a chance to speak with him. If you're opposed <laughs> to theft, why, uh, you must think a person has a right to his property. It's kind of, a, kind of a contradictory and puzzling statement. But he said property is theft. So. Adam Smith, the philosopher of freedom, Karl Marx, the philosopher of socialism. They would both profess to the same goals as far as society, the good society, good wages, peace, prosperity, and Adam Smith would say the same thing, but they would take very different approaches to this society. Well, we have different fears, and I want to demonstrate to you that the fears of the collectivists are false, and that the fears of the individualists are valid. If we go back into history of economic thought, it puzzled the philosophers for years as to what created value, what gave a thing its value. If you studied economic history, you remember the scholastics. Even the early Greeks couldn't discover what gave a thing its value. This uh, tape recorder, why is it what it's worth? Uh, the chair, the shoes you wear, what gives them their value? The Greeks never solved the puzzle of value. The scholastics, Martin Luther, Thomas Aquinas, talked about the just price. And what indeed gives a thing its value? Why should milk be worth more than gasoline? Or gasoline worth more or less than beer? Why should a thing have its value? Adam Smith thought that he had found an answer to this puzzle. Now Smith, in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, said that every individual labors to render the revenue of society as great as he can. He indeed neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. It's this famous phrase, the invisible hand. Adam Smith would say there's a spontaneous order in society. And Smith then tried to discover what caused value, what gave a thing its value, and he came up with an answer that satisfied Smith at least. And he said, at all times and places, that is dear which it is difficult to come at or which it costs much labor to acquire. And that is cheap which is to be had easily or with very little labor. Labor alone, therefore, never varying in its own value, is alone the ultimate and real standard by which the value of all commodities can at all times and places be estimated and compared. Labor is the real price. Money is the nominal price only. So Smith would say, if you want to find the value of the shoes you're wearing, find out how much labor was put into them. And then you'll have the value. It's an objective theory. 
there were problems with the theory. But each of these articles, these glasses that I hold in my hand, the building that we're in have certain properties. The glasses, for instance, have objective properties. We can weigh them to find the weight. We can measure the hardness, the durability. All the physical properties are in the glasses. They would be here whether the men existed or not. And Adam Smith said, the, the value is in the glasses. It's objective, it's put there by labor. If you want to find the value of the glasses, look to the labor. Adam Smith, uh, correction, Karl Marx was born in 1818. He was raised in the Russian, uh, Prussian Rhineland. He was subjected to the thoughts of the French Revolution and the Restoration. And Karl Marx accepted the classical economics of Adam Smith and Ricardo, David Ricardo. Now, you can divide Marxist thought into three elements. Number one is dialectic materialism. Marx said everything that happens, happens because of material causes. He said the architect, the priest, get their inspir the, the uh, ph philosopher and the priest get their inspiration from the architect and the engineer. And he put a materialist construction on everything that happened. For instance, if you would lay this up on cases, he would say the uh, discovery of the compass enabled men to sail the seas and go beyond the horizons, and this opened up the age of discovery, and this subsequently led to the Enlightenment. Or you could say that the discovery of the steam engine meant that women could push a button as well as men, and one day you'd have women's lib. Or you could say that with uh, the discovery of the pill, uh, birth control, women could come out of the homes and could go into the factories, and this would lead to women's lib. These are all materialist constructions. That's one part of Marx. The second part was his economics, and as I say, he took this almost entirely from the classical philosophers. Adam Smith, including the labor theory of value. But Marx put a different construction in the idea. He said if labor creates the value, then any part of the labor that's taken by the capitalist is exploitation. Labor created the value and naturally has a right to that value. And so if the value is in the good, it belongs to the laborer. And if ever there's an exchange of goods, there have to be, if there's a profit, there has to be an equal and an opposite loss. It's a zero-sum game. So there will be exploitation as long as the laborer does not get the full product of what he has created, that the value is in the object. And then, taking this labor theory of value, Marx then went on to the theory of the class struggle, which is the third part of its system, and that is that the laborer is, is, is oppressed because the capitalist drains off this value through the exploitative system of private property. There were problems with the labor theory of value. For instance, the chair you're sitting in, as it gets old, deteriorates, depreciates, becomes worth less and less. You don't get as much for a second-hand chair until it's depreciated for 100 years, and then it starts to appreciate. How come? It has nothing to do with the labor content. Or, if I make a mud pie that takes as much labor as a lemon pie, can I sell it for the same price? Does it have the same value? It doesn't. Or why does cheese, as it ages, become worth more to people who like aged cheese and become worth less to people who don't like aged cheese? So there are all kinds of holes in this labor theory of value. Well, Marx said, we're talking about socially necessary labor, but that was a cop-out. That was kind of an elastic cement that put the theory together. In effect, the theory didn't hold water, and Marx knew it, and economics just kind of festered and didn't develop because people couldn't explain why mud pies weren't worth as much as apple pies by the labor theory of value. And then in 1871, at the University of Vienna, Karl Menger derived the subjective theory of value. And he said that the value is not in the apple pies or the mud pies. The value is in the mind of the beholder. The value is not in the glasses. The value is not in the, in the shoes. It's not in the chairs. Value is not objective. It's not in the, object, in the object. And I quote from Menger's book, Value is nothing inherent in goods. It is no property of them, nor an independent thing existing by itself. It is a judgment that economizing men make about the importance of goods at their disposal and the maintenance of their lives and well-being. Hence, 
value does not exist outside the consciousness of men. And so a thing is worth what you think it's worth, what you're willing to exchange for. And value is in flux because your values are in flux. You think differently when you're ill than when you're well. You think differently when you're cold than when you're warm, and when you're old and when you're young, and you will think differently tomorrow than you do today. And you can't control your thoughts. And price control is an attempt to control thought. And how can the politician control prices or control your thoughts when you can't control them yourself? You can't tell yourself what you're going to dream tonight. You can't tell yourself what you're going to think tomorrow. Your thoughts are just a flow of consciousness, and they're in constant flux. And one day you like ice cream, and another day you like it less. And one day you're thirsty, and water will be very valuable to you if you're on the desert. And if you're on a canoe in Lake Michigan, water will not have the same value. Value is in the head, and value is not in the object. It's subjective, and it's a matter of opinion. It's like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Value is in the eye of the exchanger. So value is subjective. Marx, after 1870, never wrote anything meaningful. Das Kapital, the first volume, was completed in 1865. Marx was a man of Catholic interest, very wide interest. This subjective theory of value was independently discovered by Menger at Vienna, by Valra, the Frenchman in Switzerland, and by Jevons in England at about the same time. And the subjective theory of value is now almost universally accepted in the world, this idea. And Marx, after 1865 and the publication of the first volume, never wrote anything meaningful. The second and third volumes of Das Kapital were published by Jenny and Frederick Engels after Marx's death. I have no knowledge that Marx really heard about the subjective theory of value, but given the Catholicity of his interests, I can't help but feel that he is exposed to the idea. And the whole idea of class struggle is based on this idea of objective value and exploitation, the labor theory of value, and the whole structure, the Marxian structure, falls apart without the objective theory of value. That was the end of Marxian thought. And as a consequence, because the value is in the object, Whenever there's an exchange, there's not exploitation. There's not an equal profit and loss, but there are two gains, or the exchange doesn't take place. Why would anybody exchange for a loss if you could measure value? Why would anybody exchange equally? There'd be no incentive for an equal exchange. You only exchange when you expect to gain, and when people have different values, there are two gains to the exchange, or the exchange doesn't take place. I have 10 horses, you have 10 cows. I want milk and cheese and meat, and you want to ride, or you want to draw your plow, so we can exchange. But after I have one cow, and now I have nine horses, my values have changed again. I like cows a little bit less and horses a little bit more, depending on the supply and the needs and your individual caprice and idiosyncrasy. So value then, it's very important to understand, is in the head. Value is subjective. And without appraising men, there is no value. If the world existed without men, all the material goods, all the, all the properties of nature would be the same. Rocks would be hard. They'd be heavy. They'd have the same physical properties. They'd have no value. But it takes an appraising mind to determine value. Value is subjective. Labor is invested in an object because it is expected to have value. It doesn't have value because the labor is invested. Well, with that as background, then let's talk about what makes wages rise. And I'm going to put a little formula on the board that was derived by the American Economic Foundation, and I'm going to put my own variation on it. MMW equals NR plus HE plus T. The American Economic Foundation put a time sign in there. And they were saying, in effect, that MMW, which is man's material welfare, is a function of three factors, one of which is NR, which is what? Natural resources. Natural resources. That's one of the economic elements found in nature. And HE is? Human energy. Labor. Land, labor. And T? 
<laughs> well, I say time. They said tools, which is what you're saying with technology. But technology is not found in nature, or tools are not found in nature. And they say one of the differences between men and animals, the lower animals, is that men are tool users. But even there, there's there are exceptions. You've seen perhaps on Marlon Perkins that the otter takes a rock and cracks a crustacean. Or you, this gal that studied uh, gorillas in the Congo found that the gorilla would take a leaf and cup it to drink. Or they even have cases of chimpanzees stripping the leaves from a stick and putting them in an ant, hole, ant hill to gather the ants. Cases of animals forming tools, but rare. The man with his opposed thumb and his mind that can rationalize can imagine from what is to what could be can form tools. And these people had the word tools as the common element, tools being the simple word for capital. Land, labor, capital. I say time is right that tools are not found in nature. And saying that tools are a basic element is like saying to build a house, you need a half-built house to start. There are no tools in nature. So. Man's material welfare, or his wage, and here, let me feature real wages as opposed to money wages. The highest money wages in the world would be Germany, 1923, when a billion marks wouldn't buy lunch. So I'm not talking about pounds or pesos or rupees or dollars. I'm talking about the purchasing power of the paycheck, the real wage. The real wage is a function of natural resources, human energy, and time. And if you want to find the highest wage in the world, where would you go? You'd go to where the elements were put together. Technology. In a sophisticated fashion. If you wanted to find low wages, you would go to the Primitive people, New Guinea, uh, the early cavemen. In history, the cavemen perhaps started at a level down here. And one day, some genius, one of these hunters, gatherers, tribes which would go out and gather insects and bugs and lizards, that sort of thing, found that he could tie a stick to a stone, make a stone ax, and increase his yield. And the day that he tied the stick to the stone, it took labor, and he wasn't out gathering. He didn't live very well. But the next day, he was a mighty hunter because he had a stone ax. That's the first piece of capital, a new technology, a new technique for hunting and gathering. And then they discovered the bow and arrow. And then somebody discovered that uh, by curling clay, you could make a pot. And if you got wet, it would return plasticity. But then you could bake it and it would become ceramic, and you could carry water. So when you wanted to drink, you didn't have to go to the river, which might have been dangerous and was certainly laborious, but you could carry a vessel with water to the cave. And then you might even hollow out a log and make a pipe, and it took a lot of work to do that. It was a sophisticated technology. But in the long run, you did a lot less laboring by having the water delivered to your door, running water, and weaving, and tanning. And then one day, the economic revolution of returning to the campsite and finding that the seeds had sprouted, the discarded seeds had sprouted. And with some fertilization and uh, irrigation, you have an economic revolution and you turn from the hunting gathering society to the agricultural and pastoral societies. And with each, each of these technological innovations, the living standards would go up. And they wouldn't go up in a straight line because you had pestilence and war and famine and drought and that sort of thing. But they went up, and in 1776, in certain areas, they started to go up geometrically. And what happened in 1776? What was the, caused the great economic revolution in 1776? Well, the Wealth of Nations was published that year. That's right. And it provided a rationale for the free market, the laissez-faire idea. Governments stay out of the way. That's not what I'm thinking of. There, declaration. Well, the Declaration was a revolt against mercantilism. Before, Adam Smith uh, devastated the idea of mercantilism, uh, mercantilism and exposed it. And he said, the wealth is not money. Money is just an exchange medium for real wealth, which is fishnets, or plows, or flocks, or factories, the real wealth. And so there was the 
revolt against mercantilism, the colonies revolted against George III and the Tea Act and the Stamp Act and the Navigation Acts and the Intolerable Acts. It was, a, it, it was a revolt against this idea of economic domination by a mother country. Send out the colonies, bring in raw materials, send back the manufactured goods. That was mercantilism and the American Revolution was against that. That's not what I'm thinking of. What else happened in 1776? There was an economic revolution, a very important economic event. And before 1776, the energy source was human, was muscles. Steam engine. The steam engine. James Watt patented the first steam engine in 1776. And once Watt taught men how to harness fuel, anything became possible. You could send a man to the moon. Before 1776, it was muscle energy, the sun. You know, it all stemmed from the sun. The sun shines on the earth. The plants convert light energy to sugar, photosynthesis. Men eat the plants, or the animals eat the plants, and the men eat the animals. The sun was the source, or the sun would evaporate water, spill it on the mountains. Men would catch it as it ran down. Or the sun would cause meteorological disturbances, and you'd harness this with a windmill. But the source was the sun. But in 1776, Watt taught men to harness fuel. And then anything became possible, even to bringing women out of the kitchens, if you put a materialist interpretation on history. So between 1776, the Revolutionary War period, and the Civil War, the textile industry was mechanized. And these steam engines were put on moving platforms, boats, and railroads began to develop and the cost of transportation went down. And you could pump water out of the coal mines, so anybody who bought coal found that the price of coal went down. And each, each of these technological innovations would raise productivity, would raise wages. And then between the Civil War and the First World War, with the mechanization of the farms and internal combustion and some electrification, wages doubled again. And between the First World War and the Second World War, and now you're getting into electronics and aviation, all manner of elect uh, electrification. Each of these technological innovations raised living standards, so two times two times two. In that period of 200 years, 1776 to 1976, real wages went up about 12-fold. Nobody planned it that way. It was the invisible hand at work. Adam Smith would have understood this very well. Wages were going up with productivity, and productivity was a function of technology. So can we say that we have high living standards in the United States because we have the world's most abundant resources? The American Indians, before the white men came, had the same resources, but they didn't have the same technology. And the Swiss and the Japanese, who have practically no resources in their national borders, the Swiss have water power, but not too much else, have a very high living standard. In effect, the resources, the world's resources, are available to the highest bidder. They're available to whoever wants to pay the price. Everybody has resources. It isn't American wheat, Brazilian coffee, Iranian oil. It belongs to the highest bidder. It belongs to the world. So we don't have high living standards because we have the highest development of natural resources. Well, then, is it human energy? Are we supermen? Well, of course, we're made up of all nations and all races. And you'll find in Asia, the living standards are very high in Japan and Taiwan. But they're very low in Korea. They're low in China, mainland China. But they're rising faster in some of these areas than any other place. Well, then, is the answer time? Well, we all have 24 hours in the day. And of course, the answer is technology, starting from simple spear throwers, spear bearers, starting, continuing on to the pastoral and agricultural people, and then you get into the Industrial Revolution and living standards really take off. You can say, in effect, that the level of wages is in proportion to technology, and that the capitalist himself would never voluntarily raise wages. It isn't his nature. You perhaps have heard of Samuel Gompers, the founder of the AFL. And he was at the turn of the century, uh, probably 1800, 
probably the most important labor leader in the country, and they came to Mr. Gompers and they said, Gompers, you keep asking for more for the workers. You ask for higher wages, you ask for a shorter work week, you ask for vacations, you ask for fringe benefits. Can you sum it up? What is it that the workers want? And what did he answer? More. More. And you know, what is it that the businessman wants? More. And what is it that the housewife wants when she goes to the store? She wants more. And the teachers want more. And it's just what makes the, the world turn. Economic actors want more. They want to buy cheap and sell dear. And every business conference I've ever been to, trade show, whether it's the sporting goods manufacturers, the Work Love Institute, the National Shoe Fair, the businessmen say two things. They say the prices that we have to pay are too high. We pay too much for energy. We pay too much for labor. We pay too much for construction. Costs are just terrible. And on the other hand, they say, we can't get enough for our product. And what they're saying, in effect, is more. We want more. Would the, would the businessman voluntarily raise wages? No way. He tries to hold, hold his costs down. And it's not his intention to raise wages at all. And yet, wages kept <coughs> rising. The businessman is stimulated by the desire for profit. That's why he starts his business. That's why James Watt invented the steam engine. It's why Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which he patented, and then people ran around the patent. It was so easy to make. He couldn't make it stick. He invented interchangeable parts to make rifles for the army. Then he had to invent uh, the machine tools to make the interchangeable parts. He did this all to make a profit. And by doing it, he extended the institution of slavery because people could now take seeds out of cotton more easily than they could before. And slavery got new birth in the United States because of Eli Whitney. But also the price of textiles came down, and the price of clothing came down, and real wages were rising because textiles were cheap. And the inventors of the steam engine, the inventors of the railroad, Henry Ford and his uh, assembly line, McCormick and his reaper, each of these technical innovations raised living standards. The businessman didn't do this in order to help humanity or to raise wages. He did it to make a profit. That made the businessman tick. But he was disciplined by competition. The businessman does not decide what he pays in the way of wages. The businessman does not decide what he pays for anything. He goes into the market. And these prices are set by impersonal market decisions. And the actions of businessmen and capitalists and entrepreneurs are not arbitrary. They're simply subject to the laws of the market. The businessman is always under the discipline of competition. So wages are in proportion to capital investment, and profits tend to be in proportion to capital investment. And would anybody like to hazard a guess as to how many dollars of capital there are behind every worker in the United States today? about $70,000. And this is going to vary a lot from one industry to another. There are labor-intensive industries, and there are capital-intensive industries. But the average of all industry is about $70,000. And the person who has $70,000 to invest will get a real return adjusted for inflation of about 6% which would be about $4,000, wouldn't it? $4,200, if you were going to be exact. If you were the capitalist with that $70,000, you could get about 6% or $4,000. And the average wage earner in the United States, the average salary, fringe benefits and so on, is about $20,000. So the pie is split. About one-sixth goes to the capitalist, and about five-sixths goes to the worker. Nobody planned it that way. It's that way as far back as I'm able to discover in statistics. It's that way in about every industrial society. About one-sixth goes to the owner. About five-sixths goes to the workers. And the owners and workers are not separate, but almost everybody is, in a certain sense, worker. Almost even to the president of the bank, the janitor, or the tellers, they're all workers. And almost everybody is also a capitalist in the sense that he owns shares of stock or an insurance policy or a profit sharing plan or a, a uh, retirement plan of some kind. 
almost everybody is both worker and capitalist. And the division is about one-sixth in the role as capitalist and about five-sixths is the role as worker. And this is the way it works out. So we can say, in effect, that wages are a function of technology and profit is a function of technology. And so when Karl Marx says, rereading that little track, what is the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit in their reciprocal relation? They stand in inverse proportion to each other. Marx was standing on his head. They stand in direct proportion to each other. And both are a function of capital investment. Wages and profits are in proportion. And of course, if this is true, there is no class struggle. Wages are not raised by good intention. They're not raised by collective bargaining, by uh, minimum wage laws or welfare legislation. Wages are a function of productivity. And productivity obtains the fastest where the technology is the greatest. And this is where you have a profit motive. Any questions? Is this clear? Wages are a function of productivity, a function of technology. I make the point that collective bargaining doesn't raise wages and go further than this and say the only possible effect of unions is to hold down wages. But again, you have to look beyond the surface. For instance, suppose that the teachers in an area, there are teachers in the room, decide to bargain collectively, join a union, uh, go on strike if necessary to extract a greater return than they would through regular market bargaining. They win a wage increase after they strike, and therefore, ipso facto, unions did raise wages if you stop there. But if you think a little deeper, you realize that when the teachers get a wage increase, the taxpayers get a wage decrease. There is no real increase in productivity or no real increase in wages through collective bargaining. Well, you can say, well, Suppose uh, we get a wage increase from General Motors. We'll take it out of profits. You can't squeeze profits, because when you do, the marginal operators go out of business, the, the Studebakers and the Packards and the Hudsons. And the ones that are left can raise their price. And when profits become above a certain norm, people start to expand, the manufacturers expand, and then it gets more competitive, and then the profits are squeezed. So it's almost like a servo mechanism. It's almost like the invisible hand. You can't squeeze profits. So wages and profits are a function of technology. And if you were going to increase wages, bargain collectively, how would you do it? Would you do it by getting a bigger share of the pie? You can't do it. You can't squeeze profits. The actions of businessmen are not arbitrary but they're subject to the laws of the market. The way you get greater wages is to increase the pie, increase the size of the pie. And that comes through technology, productivity and technology. And the unions, through uh, feather bedding, through strike losses, through uh, union dues, tend to hold wages down. And you'll hear businessmen say, well, at one time the unions were too strong, but they were necessary. I make the point that the unions always have been a factor in holding wages down. And if unions had never existed, wages would be higher today than they are. Wages are a function of technology. Profits are a function of technology. Wages and profits are in direct relation and not inverse relation. The ideas of freedom, as they relate to the meaning and the welfare of the individual, have been clearly expressed throughout time. From the ancient Greeks to our founding fathers, 
and now many voices among us today. But not so long ago, in the years just after World War II, the voices expressing the freedom philosophy were few and isolated. It was a low point for the philosophy of limited government, free markets, and the private property order. The array of forces proposing various forms of socialism and the welfare state were being heard everywhere. The case for individual freedom was virtually unknown. One man in particular saw the need to gather the voices of freedom to provide a broad-based institutional framework. And so, in 1946, the late Leonard E. Reed and a few of his friends organized the Foundation for Economic Education to bring coherence, structure, and life to the ideas of liberty before it was too late. As Leonard Reed and his friends so clearly perceived, socialism was on the increase, not because it was right, but because no alternative was being heard. Voices for the free society had no platform from which to offer a positive alternative that was consistent, easily understood, morally correct, and intellectually exciting. The Foundation has been a significant force in changing that situation. Over the last 40 years, more than any other organization, the Foundation, or FEE as it is known to its friends, has acted as a first source, an introduction to the philosophy of freedom. While others have concentrated on policy studies, FEE has maintained a commitment to basic principles, the ideal concept, always making the connection between economic education, moral and spiritual development, self-improvement, and the philosophy of freedom. There has been a profound and telling change in the public awareness of freedom, both in the United States and around the world. Now the ideas of individual freedom of choice, limited government, a free market economy, and private property rights are again claiming our attention. Much of this success can be attributed to FEE and to its effective efforts over the years in advancing the causes of liberty. FEE set in motion a chain of events and released a number of people. And that chain of events and those, those people have made a significant impact on what we understand about freedom today. But what actually is FEE? And how has it been so instrumental in giving new life to the freedom philosophy? First, FEE is an ever-expanding circle of students of liberty, people from every sphere of life who seek to understand and practice the principles of the free market, private property, and limited government. These people then take the opportunity to impart to others the excitement of what they have learned. I truly believe that without economic freedom, there can be no personal freedom. And I think, if anything, that education uh, for me has come from, from FEE. Second, FEE is the oldest of the freedom institutions, and it continues to be a leading voice for liberty, having affected more people and influenced more institutions and organizations than any other freedom enterprise. Third, FEE is a committed board of trustees featuring some of the most principled freedom devotees in America. People who study, practice, and are dedicated to the philosophy of freedom. And fourth, FEE is a highly dedicated professional staff who coordinate a broad range of integrated programs. Programs like publishing, some people supporting the freedom philosophy will find themselves more attracted to one rather than the other, but show the range and really be pointing out that the foundation is equipping people who belong to any one of these. Sound ideas are the most effective counter to the seemingly compassionate arguments of socialism. Part of Fee's mission is to discover and draw attention to the sound ideas and economic principles that underlie the free market through a large and expanding publishing program. Since January of 1956, the magazine The Freeman has been published by the Foundation on a monthly basis. 
This study journal has gone to thousands of individuals for the asking. The Freeman, originating under the supervision of Paul Perot, is the oldest of the journals written from a free market perspective. As a matter of fact, when virtually no one else was interested in advancing free market ideas, the Freeman was quietly presenting its case to students, teachers, clergymen, and business people. And Fee presents that case through longer, more in-depth publications like The Law by Frederick Bastiat, The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, Anything That's Peaceful by Leonard Reed, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, and hundreds of others. Over the years, Fee has sold or given away millions of copies of various publications. Prices, free market, prices, direct production. You know, once in a while you may wonder that in this capitalistic system without a central plan, without a central brains in Washington telling 200 million Americans what to do, and yet there's a marvelous order of things in economic life, a very rational economic order and without a central plan. And all this is achieved, accomplished, through the signal of price. Seminars. In the interest of more concentrated times of study, each year since 1952, hundreds of people have come to a wide-ranging program of fee seminars at Irvington, New York, as well as regionally throughout the country. In these focused times together, Fee staff and guest faculty give participants an in-depth look at the freedom philosophy or present the freedom perspective on some topical subject. Soon or late, concludes Keynes, it is ideas which are dangerous for good or evil. End of quote. These people, as we know, worked hard and they believe that the products of their labor belonged to the individual producer which is the basic idea of the free market economy. Uh -oh. <laughs> this scenic estate on the Hudson River, just north of New York City, provides an ideal setting for person-to-person -person interaction, for those who are perhaps new to the freedom philosophy. Suppose one of you were offered a job that had wonderful working conditions, the young are often among those to whom the principles of freedom are new. For that reason, the fee staff have developed programs to take free market economic education into the colleges and high schools, with speakers willing to talk to entire student bodies, classes, or small discussion groups. And fee continues to reach young people through its undergraduate seminars, correspondence, debate materials, essay contests, and attractively priced books. What makes FEE different from other organizations dedicated to promoting the free society? Not just the length of time that it has been active, not just the quantity and quality of its publications, not just the seminars and classes that it presents, but its insistence on fundamental self-education and application. Rather than directly confront the people who imply that a free society can't work, the FEE approach is to help individuals confront the ideas that are contrary to liberty by emphasizing the importance of basic philosophy and principled economic understanding. Only individual change can truly change society. Freedom is not licentiousness. Freedom is acting in a moral or a responsible sense. Because to the degree that free will is exerted without a, res a sense of responsibility, then instead of expanding freedom, uh, freedom is destroyed. The Foundation for Economic Education, through its many program activities, is dedicated to individual freedom of choice, private property, and the free market economy, which makes it possible. Thousands of people all over the country support our efforts. We sincerely hope that you will join forces with these many freedom devotees 
and let us send you a sampling of our materials. Simply write to us, and we'll send you our monthly journal, The Freeman, along with descriptive material about our activities. Please write to Foundation for Economic Education, 30 South Broadway, Irvington, New York, 10533. Thank you.